I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. My daughter and I are here for a special announcement, which is that Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books was just nominated for a Webby Award in the Arts and Culture category for podcasts. So please, please vote by April 18th so that I can win the People's Choice component of this award. And now my daughter has a little something to say. Hi. I love my mom so much, and she's been working really hard for this podcast to be on Instagram. <laughs> and I also want you to know that I love her, so please, please, please vote for Zimby. Oh, that's right. This is Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books, and I love my mom so much. Please vote for Zimby Owens' Webby Awards. The website is vote.webbyawards.com. Today's episode has been sponsored by Serial Box. Serial Box delivers addictive book content in short listen or read installments designed to fit into today's fast-paced mobile lifestyle. Switch between listening and reading with a single click, picking up right where you left off. Learn more at SerialBox.com, S-E-R-I-A-L-B-O-X.com. Hi, I'm thrilled to be interviewing Pamela Paul today. Pamela is the editor of the New York Times Book Review and oversees all book coverage at the Times. She hosts the weekly podcast Inside the New York Times Book Review. Pamela has written many books, including her fantastic memoir, My Life with Bob, Flawed Heroine Keeps, Book of Books, Plot Ensues. She also wrote The Starter Marriage and the Future of Matrimony, Parenting Inc., How the Billion Dollar Baby Business Has Changed the Way We Raise Our Children, and Bornified, How Pornography is Damaging Our Lives, Our Relationships, and Our Families. She also edited by the book Writers on Literature and the Literary Life from the New York Times Book Review. Pamela wrote the storied column in the Sunday Style section of the New York Times and has had her work published in The Atlantic, The Washington Post, The Economist, Vogue, and many more publications. Her next book, How to Raise a Reader, is coming out soon. A graduate of Brown University, Pamela lives in the New York area with her husband and three children. Welcome, Pamela, to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for taking the time. If you don't mind, I want to start with the op-ed you wrote recently for the New York Times called Let Children Get Bored Again, because I've had it up on my bulletin board since you wrote it. <laughs> I've, had, I've had my mom send it to me. I, anyway, I, it's like I keep thinking about it. So let's talk about that for a sec, if that's okay. Oh, sure. I mean, it's funny. There, there were a couple of impetuses for that piece. One was the fact that at back to school night in, at, in our schools, I kept hearing this language that I, you know, don't recall ever being used when I was a student, which was the, the, it's as if the teachers feel quite desperate to capture children's attention and to engage them and that they try to do this by constantly upping the ante. And I, I, to me, that's a kind of dangerous thing, right? Because yeah. you have kids who are sort of constantly being encouraged to on by by teachers to become accustomed to a higher level of like entertainment Mm -hmm. and diversion and then at home they're also encouraged and it's not that either teachers or parents are necessarily to blame here I think there are a lot of factors at work but what happens is that they kind of mutually feed off each other right because if the if children are constantly entertained and diverted in a home then when they get to school it's incredibly boring by comparison right and vice versa so that was sort of one thing the second thing was personal because I don't think this is just about kids. I think it's about us as mm-hmm. adults as well. I had been contemplating, like probably many people have contemplated, starting to meditate. It's one of those like 25-year-old goals that I've had that I <laughs> still haven't acted on. And there had been a number of articles in the Times about meditating. And I just kept thinking, well, how am I going to squeeze this in? I don't have time to meditate. What would have to go? Would I cut out physical therapy? Would I cut out exercise? Would I cut out a walk to work? Would I cut out something with my kids? Would I go to work late? Like, I, I, I didn't know how to figure out how to have time to do that. And then I thought, like, that's crazy, first of all. <laughs> but secondly, if I did have 20 minutes to spare every day and I did want it to be some kind of downtime, not that there's anything wrong with meditation. I still think I should meditate, but it's like the opposite of boredom, right? It's very intentional downtime. And I thought that's so typical of us as adults too, that we want to maximize every single moment of our day. And that even when I am walking to the train station, I think to myself, oh, you know, there's not a lot of foot traffic here. I could actually answer some emails while I'm walking or shouldn't I get a headset and listen to a podcast while I'm walking or like, how could I use this time better? 
And so I think there's just a pervasive sense that if you have downtime, if you have quote unquote empty time, it's kind of on you to fill it. And I think we're teaching this to, to kids at an early age. And I think that we as adults have become kind of accustomed to it. And so that was the kind of genesis of that piece. And in the piece, you said that things really happen when you're bored. And you said it's when you're bored that stories set in, right? It's like that's when you can become most creative. And that's what we're Absolutely. missing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I think back, when I think back to the jobs that I had as a teenager, and I started working when I, I, you know, beyond babysitting when I was 13, back when, you know, kids really worked after school. And I actually loved those jobs. They're the kinds of things that you might consider on the face of it to be incredibly boring. I was putting together sales sheets in a factory. I worked at a supermarket checking out items. I did lots of really menial kinds of jobs. And I, in fact, loved it because you know, it it was like a downtime and a forced break. It's like taking a shower is today, right? Mm -hmm. When you're taking a shower, we pretty much know what we're looking at and we pretty much know what we have to do. So your mind is, you know, otherwise empty. And I don't know about you, but I have some of my best ideas in the shower and it's because I'm forced to think about, you know, something other than, you know, shampooing my hair. (laughs) And so I actually find myself kind of constantly, you know, dashing out of the shower to take a note of something because that's one of the few times where my brain just has that space to free float. I feel that way sometimes when I attend board meetings that are a little bit slow and I use the notepad to just like write down all these ideas I'm having about other things and I should be paying attention. But it's the same thing, same concept. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my husband used to say, you know, when we would be at some incredibly boring, you know, meeting together or at a school event or something, I'd be like, how are you doing? And he said, I'm at SeaWorld, you know, which was his metaphor basically <laughs> saying like, I'm not, I'm not actually here. I'm like, <laughs> in, you know, fantasy land. Well, the article was really good reminder of the importance of that. So, so thanks for that. And I loved your book, the, your, me- I know you've written many books, but your memoir, My Life with Bob, like totally resonated with me, I think, cause I'm a huge book lover too. Although I didn't have the foresight to record every book I've ever read the way you've done, which is amazing and incredible. And you mentioned how you were so shy as a child. And you said at one point, social skills were not your forte. Although having met you now, I, I would disagree with that. But anyway, <laughs> and you said, you know, reading was the one thing when you were young that you were good at. So I was just wondering, do you think that shy kids end up sort of drifting more towards reading and writing? Because I was a very shy kid as well, and that's sort of where I ended up. But I didn't know if you thought there was a link there. I definitely think there's a link towards shyness or introversion and reading because books and stories are filled with characters and characters can be very good company. And also, you know, characters in these stories to show us ways to negotiate and interact with the rest of the world, right? So if you're not quite sure how things operate, how to do things, then you can figure that out in a book. I mean, I also have one memory. I was actually talking to one of my children about this. We were talking about, you know, really embarrassing, stupid things that happen when you're little that stay with you for a very long time. And I remember one time I had just moved to a new town and I was standing at resource. I was not at all sporty and I didn't know anyone and I was all by myself. And I remember being sort of isolated on the concrete standing there and someone dashing up to me and saying the flood's over and running away and people laughing. And it wasn't until I read that particular insult in a book a few years later that I even knew what it meant, which is that my pants were too short because they were hand-me-downs. And that was like a major fashion faux pas at the time I was in grade school. I, I, I didn't realize it. But it's interesting that, you know, nobody was going to tell me that. And I, I'm sure that most of the other kids completely forgot about it, you know, within 10 minutes, but I didn't forget. And I didn't really understand it until I read it in a novel. I pretty much haven't forgotten any negative thing anyone's ever said. (laughs) The the positive (laughs) thing, the positive things away. (laughs) We file these things away, but you know, in stories, that's where also you learn how to cope with it because I think, you know, children's books writers, the successful ones, the good ones, and I think most publishers are also in, in the children's book world really conscientious about this is that the, those characters reflect real people in mm-hmm. our lives, even in fantasy stories. You know, you can have a dragon story where they're, they're dragons, but those dragons are actually kids, and those kids are actually having real 
childlike emotions. Mm -hmm. And so for kids, even who just need one step of remove from where they are, that helps them. And you see other kids, other introspective kids, other bookish kids, other shy kids in these stories. And in those stories, they're the heroes. I mean, I think one of the incredible things that Rick Riordan did, he's the author of the Percy Jackson books, is to make his hero dyslexic and to turn that into, you know, a kind of signal for strength and for greatness because that took kids who were feeling self-conscious about their inability or their difficulty in reading and turned it into a strength. Yeah, you said something very similar in the book. You wrote, if something happened to one of the characters that had happened to you, it meant you weren't a freak. There was a precedent. And if you could find out what they did about it, you might find your own solution or at least learn what not to do. So I yeah. feel like that's totally it, right? That that books in a way always are like validation that we aren't so crazy ourselves, right? That other people feel the way we do either now or as kids or that we're somehow not alone. Well, what's funny is when I started keeping my book of books, I really kind of kept that to myself. It wasn't something I ran around telling people about my dorky diary. (laughs) But when I first wrote about it, which was in 2012, I was working at the New York Times Book Review, and we were launching this feature called By the Book, which was sort of questionnaire interview with an author or other public figure about their reading life. I thought, this makes sense to me that you can tell a lot about a person by what they read, but maybe it won't be quite obvious to our readers. And so for that particular issue where we launched and David Starris was the first subject, I wrote an essay about my book of books that I called Bob. And that essay I think was called My Life with Bob in the New York Times and it ran on the back page. And after it ran, I just got this deluge of emails and also snail mail letters that had in the letters, photocopies or photographs of people's own book of books. Mm. Because it turned out I wasn't the only person. I wasn't the only freak out there that kept this crazy diary of all of the books that I had ever read. So even late in life, it was sort of validating to find out that my book of books actually isn't the, you know, a completely freakish idea, but something that other people had done because they too wanted to kind of keep track of their own life through the stories that they had read. I think I'm going to have my kids start keeping a book of books now. <laughs> it's too late for me. Well, I guess I could start, but at least they would have the context like that you have that they could look back. But Yeah, it's interesting. You know, one of the things that is happening in schools right now is a lot of schools are forcing kids to keep these book records, like mm-hmm. these weekly book sheets where you have to write down the book that you're reading and how much time you spent reading it. And it's usually on like a loose piece of paper. And that turns reading into a chore. Mm, um, that is something that is not for you. It's for the school and it's not kept in any kind of keepsake way, but it's just a sheet for the teachers to make sure that kids are reading in the home. So the intent is completely noble, especially in communities where kids might not be given regular access to books through their library or through their parents. And so I understand and I get it. But what would be so much more meaningful is for them to have a book of books because then it's for them and Mm -hmm. it's about maintaining their own kind of journal and their own personal record. And I think just twisting it like slightly, just kind of turning that idea makes it much more powerful because it's not about proving to the teacher that you're reading. It's about keeping a personal memoir for yourself about who you are becoming through your own reading. That's a great idea. I love that. In your book, you talked about how you ended up sort of advocating for yourself and ending up with the job as the children's book editor of the New York Times. And I just love that story and then how that eventually became your job as the, you know, New York Times book review editor. Can you share that story with listeners? Sure. I mean, it's funny. I had been working from home and assuming you have lots of parent listeners, they will understand the joys of working from home. (laughs) I was in my pajamas all day. I had three young children. I was able to nurse all of them. I was able to take a break and have my lunch with them. So even though I had full-time childcare and I was working full-time as a journalist, I had total flexibility and freedom and I never intended to work in an office ever again. But what happened was that the previous editor of the book review was looking for someone to fill the spot of a children's book editor who had left predecessor to become at that point an agent. And it's a really hard job to fill because 
you need to have someone who obviously loves and cares about children's literature, but also someone who's a journalist. So you can't have someone who's like a librarian in that position, but you also can't have someone who's a journalist and doesn't care about kids' books at all. And so it, it was a hard job to fill, and he was asking me for help. And there had only been four children's books editors in the history of the New York Times because it's a really great job. So people who got that job held on to it. But again, kind of a, a difficult position to fill. So I had been suggesting people for it and knowing that I was certainly in Sam Townhouse, who was the editor, then also knew that I never, ever, 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 ever wanted to leave my house, <laughs> at least for work purposes. And so we were in Los Angeles where we go over a year to visit my husband's family and we were driving around and there used to be this great children's bookstore slash illustration gallery called Every Picture Tells a Story. And every time we would go out there, it was in Santa Monica, I wanted to go. But the tiresome thing about it is that my kids, of course, loved it too. And they wanted me to, you know, read them particular stories while I was there. And that was great. And I love doing that. I love reading to my kids. But I also really wanted to look at the books myself and the illustrations. So I was in the car kind of plotting with my husband, like, when can I possibly on this trip have time to go by myself? And, you know, now that my kids are a little bit older, it's hard to even recollect those days when you just negotiating like an hour to yourself is a kind of, you know, it's a complicated maneuver <laughs> to have to, to make when you don't have extensive, you know, we were on vacation, we didn't have, have childcare. And as I was saying this, I was thinking, okay, wait a minute. You're saying you want to go to a children's bookstore without your kids so that you can look at the books? Like, obviously, you really care about children's books. Like, maybe you should be the children's books editor. And so I sent an email kind of casually saying, look, you know, if you could make this job part-time, maybe I would consider taking it. And within three weeks, I was working at the New York Times. I mean, that was literally over... Christmas break in 2010. And my first day at the Times was January 24th of 2011. So it was just that like very casual, ah, I wonder <laughs> if email. And I haven't regretted it for a moment. Although there was certainly, you know, some trepidation before I started. And even as I started thinking like, what have I done? <laughs> I have left, like I had the thing that so many working mothers want, which is you know, I'm able to do what I love doing and be there for my kids. And I never have to get dressed or put on makeup. And I have given it up, you know, and it took me a while to acclimate. Even when I think back to that time, I remember looking at myself like one day and being like, wait, what am I wearing? Because I was like <laughs> still wearing maternity clothes and like sweatpants and like, you know, string, t drawstring tied mom khakis to work. Like I, just <laughs> had, I, I had like completely, it took me a while for the professional person to catch up to where I actually was. And so now you've been there for eight years. So what is it, what yeah. is it like editing the book review? Like, how do you feel having that sort of level of influence that you can sort of make or break an author's career? And what is it like for you? What's, just tell me a little more about it. Well, it's funny. I, you know, I don't really think about it that way. It is obviously a huge responsibility. And I think that it's helpful having been an author before coming into this position because it means that I am not cavalier when it comes to the impact that it has on writers' lives. Mm -hmm. But one interesting thing, and it's really hard, right, when you care about books and you work within the world of books, whether you're an author or editor or whatever, to remember this, but the New York Times' obligation isn't to the writers and the publishing industry and the aspiring writers. Our audience are readers of the New York Times. Mm -hmm. And so if a book is not that good, mm -hmm. and let's say it's coming, let's say it's coming from either a, a hugely hyped debut author, hugely hyped, getting tons of like press and excitement around it, and it's not that good. Or it's coming from someone who comes out with like a new book every year or two, and they usually do a really great job, but this one's not good. So is it our obligation to make that person feel better? Or given the fact that we are serving readers of the New York Times who are making really hard choices about like, how do I spend my time? What's worth my time and money to buy? What book should I read to give them an honest assessment of that work? And we're always going to veer towards the latter because that's who we are trying to serve. And also as journalists, you know, again, we're not in the promotional business. We are in the reporting business and, and 
it's unfortunate that uh, so many news outlets, particularly newspapers, and again, I don't blame them for this. It's a really tough environment. They've cut back on their cultural and in particular their books covered. They don't have the, the time to go through all of these books and to make those assessments and to have people who have been working in this field for you know, 10, 20. We have editors who've been at the book review for 30 years and have a really strong sense of what makes a book worthwhile, even if that book isn't to their taste. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, and that's just not, not, I mean, that requires, first of all, massive staff and time to go through all those books. We're the only freestanding newspaper book review left in the country. Wow. And we are the only outlet left that other than the trade publications that actually not just cherry picks like, oh, look, we're going to do this book and we're going to do that book and we're going to do this book, but we review the landscape. That's what the New York Times book review is. That's what a book review is. Every book that comes to our office gets a look. It might get a look for five seconds. We might know, oh, we don't cover this category. This isn't for us. But we look at all of those books and we go through them to find the ones that aren't getting the hype, the ones that are coming from a tiny new publisher, the ones that are from an author that no one has ever heard of, that are being translated from Serbian for the first time, even though the writer is a legend in Serbia. And we are going through all of that to assess for our readers. You know what? You should know about this book. So give me a visual. How does this work? You have like a room where a billion books come in. How does it all get sorted? Like, how do you <laughs> how do you assign like who reads what? How does it how do you keep track? Well, it's a huge process. Everything gets logged into a database. We have people who open up the mail twice a day and because it comes in droves and we do have a room that's dedicated to the incoming books. And then we have a huge sort of length of compressed rolling bookshelves because if you were not to have rolling bookshelves, you would have a room just even for fire code purposes that would be like you know, a a full floor of the New York Times building where we then keep the books when they're under consideration or when they've been selected for review. So there is like a a, a complicated process that you have to go through. It's It's a huge amount of tearing open of envelopes and logging books into a database and then making sure that we keep the copies around. And then they are distributed to a staff of what we call preview editors who then each week will go through let's say, 100 books and have to figure out, okay, you know, probably they have three preliminary piles. Like these ones, we're not going to do these ones. These ones, we're definitely going to do. Now this group in the middle, I don't know if we're going to do. And they have to really go through those ones more carefully and determine because it's hard. It's hard. And it's hard to say, like, if you have a history of the Civil War that comes in, to say, is this new? Is this interesting? Mm -hmm. Who's this author? Were there new sources of material for this? Like, how do I make that judgment? And we're lucky to have, you know, the editor of our history books who's been there for 30 years who could say, you know what, this is a rehash of a book this guy wrote 10 years ago, or there's no new scholarship in this, or this is not very well written, or he's left entire battles out, and this is the (laughs) military history, you know. And those are things that, like, you know, if you just glanced at it, you might not know. Or if you get let's say 20 books on Bitcoin in a month. Like how do you determine this is the one that should be reviewed and the rest of these, it doesn't make sense um, for, for people to waste their time or a novel, which I think is even harder. Let's say you have seven new short story collections coming out that month. One particular editor might get, how are you supposed to determine which one or two of those might get reviewed because we review about 1% of the books that come out oh my gosh. Um, in the United States in a given year. That's wild. Do you think? Yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's just, oh my gosh, that's, I, that's such a daunting task. I'm like stressed out just thinking about it. Not that it's necessarily something you can analyze or like make some sort of formula about, but what do you think the ingredients are for fantastic books? Oh, I mean, it's really... It's it's very hard to generalize even to say, you know, and I would say fiction has some main differences from nonfiction. Let's, let's, um, let's, say, but, let's say fiction. Let's take let's take a novel. All right. So I think with a novel, you know, there there are the things that frankly readers judge books on. Are these characters interesting? Are they credible? Are they fully fleshed out? Is this writer's voice arresting? Am I grabbed? 
in the first page? And if I'm not, am I still sort of curious about it? You know, David Foster Wallace famously said that he purposefully made the first 200 pages of Infinite Jest impossible to get through, that it was this kind of hurdle, <laughs> that if you got that, if you can get through that, then you kind of deserve to read the rest of the book. Now, I'm not saying that's true for most books, but not every book grabs you from the first page. So is there something else there? Is there something in the perspective, in the sentences, in the voice of the writer. And then when you're considering it as a whole, like how, how coherent is narrative, is it doing something new and inventive? Or is this just a great classically told traditional, you know, dig in 19th century style novel? But is the subject matter something interesting, something we haven't seen before, something that's new or something that's old but undiscovered? You know, there's, there might be a novel that takes place in the early 20th century, but it's looking at, let's say, a period in history that from a perspective of, let's say, an African-American or a Native American or from a woman or from some view that we haven't seen before. So there are a lot of ways to even take a subject matter that can feel old, but to look at it through a new lens, to do something that might be experimental or something that might feel really fresh. I mean, there are stories like you can, let's take Jenny Ophel's book, Department of Speculation, which was one of our 10 best books, I don't know, about six years ago. And it's a story about a marriage and about motherhood. And you could say there's nothing new about that subject. And yet the way that she wrote that book, the way that she handled it, it just, it felt like electrifying at the time, the, 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 her whole approach to those subjects felt really different. You know, it was like Rachel Cusk, another person who might write about things that we feel like we know. She wrote a book about new motherhood. She wrote a book about the aftermath of divorce. She's written books about sort of what it's like to be a middle-aged professional woman. And yet, in her voice, in her handling, like, those subjects feel entirely new. Wow, that was so, so interesting. That was so interesting. Thank you. Tell me about, quickly, I know we were almost out of time, your upcoming book, How to Raise a Reader. So this is a book that I co-wrote with our current children's books editor, Maria Russo, which is coming out in September. And it started off as a digital guide for the New York Times. And that guide was also called How to Raise a Reader. And when we worked on it, it was like, it was like a, I mean, as much as I love my job and I absolutely love my job, it was like a really fun but also mission-driven break from the rest of the day. It was like, oh, good, we get to do this. <laughs> and both of us felt incredibly energized by it because it was like, finally, we get to like write about this thing that we both care so much about. So it came out and it was hugely popular online. It's not something that you could actually print out. And we both thought, you know, there's just, first of all, I think we had written about 20,000 words and the final guide ended up being 8,000 words. And so a lot of stuff had sort of ended up on the cutting room floor. And we felt like this stuff is really good. Like (laughs) it, it, it deserves another life and it's really important. And so we had this idea that we really wanted to turn this material into a book, that it felt like the book, a book that had been missing because, you know, look, nobody needs to know how to teach their child to read in general. I mean, not nobody needs to know. Teachers need to know that. And parents need to know how to support that. They usually get that from the teacher. But how do you actually get a kid to like love reading? How do you have a child who gravitates toward a book when they have that bored afternoon, you know, as opposed to pick up an iPhone or, you know, do something else with their time. And I think, and I use that iPhone example because I think that it's gotten especially more difficult in a digital age when there are so many other distractions, there are so many other options. And I think it's hard for parents because parents think like, well, technology is really important. It's really important that my child be tech savvy. I think there's a lot of, of, economic insecurity that is completely understandable about with parents is like, well, you know, my child might need to do other things. They might need to go to a cello lesson. They might need to play a sport. They might need to hone hone a talent with that time as opposed to reading. And yet at the same time, I think most parents know that reading is essential, essential, not just for a child's academic sort of success, but really essential towards making a person whole, you know, it's Mm -hmm. through, it's through immersion in stories that we, I think, become who we are. And I think that one of the reasons why books as a form, as a medium, as a, a way of conveying a story is so much more powerful than a film or TV 
or a YouTube video. And I like all of those things. I, I don't really like the YouTube videos, but I do like up when there are cats. But I do like um, <laughs> TV and movies. But here's the difference. When you are reading Harry Potter for the first time, and you, let's hope, have not seen the movie yet, any of the movies, you're thinking, like, what does Harry look like? What does Hermione sound like? What does Hogwarts seem like? What does the Gryffindor Hall look like? How do these paintings that move work? And you, as the reader, as a child reader, you're coming up with those images yourself. You're filling out that picture in your mind. You have J.K. Rowling's words to guide you. But when you read, it's truly interactive. You are creating that story. That book is read by millions of people, but every single person reads it their own way. And that everything in that book looks differently, sounds differently to each reader because it's a reflection of who that person is. Stories... A book is not a book until it's read and then until it's read by an individual. Whereas with a movie or a television show, while we all have our own opinions of it, we're being shown. We're being shown Emma Watson's rendition of Hermione. We're being shown the cinematographer's sweeping view of Hogwarts. We're being shown the special effects, you know, rendition of what a lot of cadaver does to a person. We're hearing the score. All of that is being delivered to us. So we're not creating it. Mm -hmm. And I think that act of creation, that act of imagining, that sense of immersion is why books tend to stay with us for so long. It's why the books of our childhood stick with us for years. It's why we all kind of remember what was the book that made me become a reader? What was the book I wanted to hear again and again? What was that first novel, whether it was A Wrinkle in Time or Narnia, whatever it might have been? What was that book that, that you know, I just like, wanted to be in that book? We all have those kinds of memories. And I think that when, as an adult, you want to have that for your child. So the idea of the book is not necessarily to help your child decode, you know, phonetical terms and learn the mechanics of reading as it is like, how do I, how does my child end up knowing that, feeling that, getting that so that that stays with him or her for the rest of their lives? Wow. And when does that come out? So that comes out beginning of September. Oh my gosh. I can't wait. Any parting advice to aspiring writers? Oh, to aspiring writers. You know, I was reading something last night. It was the editor's letter in T Magazine coming out on Sunday. And the, with the editor's letter it was by Hanya Yanagahara, who is not only the editor of T, but also a novelist in her own right. She wrote People in the Trees. And oh, right. Yes, of course. A Little Life. And she was saying that after a day of working in the office, she comes home and she writes at night because, you know, you, you, you have to actually do the work. You have to actually sit and write. And I, I agree with that. But I also think um, for me, writing is something that I really want to do, that I enjoy doing, that I look for the time to do. And then if I don't do it, I don't feel fulfilled. And I know that that's not the same for every writer. I know there are writers who have writer's block and who find it difficult and who maybe don't enjoy it. But I would say to try to find, at least for me, my advice is to kind of find the kind of writing that is, feels like writing that you have to do. And not because you're supposed to, but because you want to, you know, like you need to do that writing and to figure out what that kind of writing is and go with that. Wow. Thank you so much. This was amazing oh, insights and advice welcome. and just all of it was fantastic. Thank you so much for spending the time. Oh, thanks for having me. Of course. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Today's episode was sponsored by Cereal Box, S-E-R-I-A-L-B-O-X.com, CerealBox.com, delivering addictive book content in short listen or read installments. Thanks to Ryan and Steve at Texture Sound for the audio editing and mixing. Thanks for listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. (laughs) 